Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, they put me first. So how many of you are here this morning for the um, pre-note, the musical? If you don't know what I'm talking about, you weren't there. If you know what I'm talking about, you're like, yeah, I was there. Um, so that got me like a little hyped up. That was my first pre-note at DrupalCon. Last year, I didn't realize they, they had pre-notes, so I showed up promptly for the keynote, only to be passed by like six superheroes going the other direction. And I was like, what just happened? Like, this is awesome. So I didn't miss it this year. And, and if you come next year, if you miss it, don't miss it. It's um, totally ridiculous. So I come from the Symphony community. Uh, we're back-end developers, so I don't know if any of us actually have any singing skills, so we don't get to do things quite like that. Um, so today I want to talk about um, Symphony. I'm really happy to see this room is actually pretty darn full, especially considering we were all outside five minutes ago. First, I come from the Symphony world, so this is my third DrupalCon, which is awesome for me because I don't actually use Drupal. I've actually started to use it a little bit, um, but I just come from a totally different world, and this is one of my favorite conferences to come to because of the energy that everybody has and because of the musicals. Um, I'm the lead uh, contributor to the Symphony documentation, so if and when you start reading that, you can thank me or send me a mean email, depending on like whatever your perspective is. We write a lot of documentation, so it's just a matter of finding things. I'm also a writer for campuniversity.com, which is um, Symphony and PHP tutorial screencasts. And most importantly, and you can help sell her out there, um, I am the husband of the much more talented Leanna Pelham, who's going to wave for us now. Hey, Leanna. Woo! Yes, I like, good, like that. Good applause there. Very nice. When she's not in the room, sometimes I'll like, have everybody like tweet at her and stuff like that. So now we just wave instead. All right. So... Let's, uh, let's look at where we've come from, where we're going here. Because my goal is, like, how many people have, have used Drupal 8 a little bit? Okay, good, 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 good. Okay, so we can, so you guys are already be familiar with some of the stuff in the beginning. The whole point of this talk is that in Drupal 7, if you're a Drupal 7 developer, you were a Drupal 7 developer. If you wanted to do something different, you had, you had some other project that didn't need Drupal, maybe there was no content, you had to kind of learn a different skill set. That is no longer the case. And it goes the other way, too. I can actually look at Drupal 8 and understand what's going on. I have no right to know what's going on in Drupal 8. But because there's so much in common between the two, I can move back and forth based on whatever problem I actually need to solve. So um, and if I have anything wrong, you guys can shout at me because uh, I'm not a Drupal developer. But apparently in Drupal 7, the way you make pages is the little hook menu stuff. So I have my dinosaur menu there. And I have a page callback. So favorite dinosaur, and then it returns the string triceratops. Um, because this is my favorite dinosaur. We have these little pins we just made, by the way. If you want one of those, they're up here. Um, so in Symphony and Silex, it's totally different, but it's not really actually very different at all. So in Symphony and Silex, we have, so let me back up. In Symphony, we have something called routes and controllers, and those of you that have used Drupal 8 a little bit may already know what these terms are. We have routes and controllers, and we have ideas of requests and responses, and we have this really fundamentally important idea of a service container. And what's really cool is in Drupal 8, we have the exact same thing. So these things right here are like the fundamental stuff that people have a hard time learning. They're wrapping their heads around this philosophy. Once you've got this, though, you have this for all of them. So let me look at, let's look at uh, what, 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 what is the fundamental stuff for a framework? Because all frameworks, whether they're in PHP or Ruby on Rails, they all basically work the exact same way, which again is a good thing because it means we can actually move our, you know, uh, pick, pick whatever solution we need for whatever problem we have. So this is Silex. How many people have uh, seen Silex before? Okay, actually a few less hands than I expected. So Silex is a micro framework um, built on top of the Symphony components. So Symphony is a framework built on top of the Symphony components. Drupal 8 is a framework or CMS built on top of the Symphony components. This is also that exact same thing, except the entire application is those six lines. That is your entire application in one file. And what we have here is we're defining one page. You see, you see slash hello slash curly brace name. So basically it's defining a URL slash hello slash anything. And when somebody goes to that URL, it's going to reach say hello that person's name. And that's the entire application right there. So let's say we are developing this. Hey, we're going to use Silex for something. So we have to go ahead and throw these six lines of code together. We spin up our web server. Or we don't. How many people have used the built-in PHP web server? Okay, if it's like a third or so, it is awesome. So PHP 5.4 and above, which you are almost all probably definitely using since 5.3 is old and deprecated. 
has a built-in web server. You can go to any directory on your machine and just say PHP dash capital S localhost colon whatever port you want to dream up, you have a web server running. It's not something you use in production, but it's something you can use when you're developing locally. So you don't necessarily, like I don't really use web servers on my local machine very often. I mean, this can't do everything, but I use this all the time. And it kind of saves the whole like, oh, I got to figure out where my Apache config is or Nginx config and set up a virtual host and all that. So I have this one file, and now I've run this one command, and I have a working application. And that is all of the fundamental concepts, using all the fundamental, like, difficult concepts that are common across Silex, Symfony, and Drupal 8. So you can see, uh, probably can't quite see up top there. But up top there, I'm just running the PHP dash capital S for localhost colon 8001, and the URL slash hello slash Drupal people, and it's just screaming that back to me. And yes, you can use that web server for Drupal as well. I use it for Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. So these are the fundamental concepts here. Request, routing, controller, and response. And I'm going to go over those really quickly, because uh, once you have your mind wrapped around those, which are not difficult concepts, everything just opens up. You can just use things, all kinds of tools everywhere. So the first thing is the route. So this is going to be like the URL to your page, or the URL pattern. So this is going to match slash hello slash star. So the curly brace thing in Symfony and Drupal, and Drupal 8. I can't, I can't actually block the microphone when I say stuff. The um, curly brace thing is a wild card. So this is a page for slash hello slash anything. So this would be like pretty similar to hook menu, right? It doesn't give me nods. It'd be like, no, that was a wrong analogy. Okay, I'm getting more nods than no's. Um, so it's the same exact idea. That's why I said earlier, I was like, it's the routes and controllers things are different, but they're actually just the exact same thing you guys were always doing. So you start with a route, and then the route points to a controller, which is a word you'll hear a lot. Don't be confused. A controller is just a function that builds your page. So that right there is just an anonymous function that builds your page. Maybe it returns JSON or full HTML. This one's pretty darn simple. And that's pretty much like the fundamental part of every framework. You have routes, which have the URL part, and they point to a controller, which is a function that you write to build the page, and that's it. That's why we only need these two parts here. There's also one little extra credit thing. Any time you have a curly brace in the URL, you can have that as an argument to your controller. And you can even do that if you have multiple curly braces. And again, this is the same in Silex, Symfony, Drupal, because they're all using the same code behind the scenes, which is wonderful. Um, and then our job, our only job really, is just to make this page. So request, so again, I'll back up because I don't talk about this too much. Our job, even more abstractly as developers, is just to return a request into a response. Request comes into the server. Our only job is to create and return a response. If you can do that in one little line, awesome. If you need to load up a bunch of node stuff and go through the theming layer, awesome. That's just another way to get to the end goal, which is creating a response. And when you boil this down to its smallest pieces, this is done by having a route and a controller, which is just a URL pattern and a function that builds the page, and now we have it. And now, if you didn't know that before, you now understand how every framework works basically in every language. So that was Silex, which is teeny tiny. So like, what is Symfony then? Well, Symfony is just Silex with kind of a directory structure. So instead of just one file, when you download like a new Symfony project, it kind of gives you just some directories and says, hey, maybe you can put stuff here and put this other stuff over here. We'll give you some organization, but it's still just that same routing controller kind of flow. So to download the Symfony framework, we have like a little installer here. So if you go to symphony.com and click download, you'll see this code here. Basically, downloads like a little binary file, a little downloader file. Once you have that up top, once, so, so the previous step gives you a little binary called Symfony. So you see I have Symfony new up there. Symfony is the name of that binary. Once you download that, whenever you want to start a new project, it's just Symfony new and then a directory name. And so this actually goes and grabs the latest version of Symfony and downloads that onto your computer and puts it in that directory, runs some you know, checks to make sure you have kind of a sane environment and all that good stuff. And even gives you like this really friendly message down there to kind of tell you what to do next. Cool, and this is what it gives you. Um, and one of the issues that you can run into in any framework is like the more files that they give you in the beginning, the more you're like, whoa, I don't know what's going on. So there is a couple non-important files that I'm hiding here, um, just to make it look easier. Those files that I'm hiding aren't actually important. This is basically all that we have inside of that new Symfony project. We have the app directory, which is configuration and templates. If you're writing anything that's not a PHP file, is going to go in that app directory. Then we have the source directory. That's where your PHP files go. 
and by the way, in Symfony, if you're creating a PHP file, it's going to be a PHP class. So this is where your PHP classes go. Uh, and that's actually it. Those are really the only two directories that you are going to touch inside of a Symfony project. The other important directory is the vendor directory. That's where like outside libraries live that are downloaded for you. If you want to like go kung fu and open up like a, a um, core code and look into it and you know mess around with stuff, you can go in there. But you know you don't actually code in there, so um, it's just kind of sitting there for us. So it's all about app and source, and that's it. So same thing. Okay, so we downloaded the project in Silex. It was just right one file. Now we kind of get this little skeleton project. Um, and then we just start the, the built-in PHP web server, which is already easy enough. Remember, it's PHP dash capital S localhost colon 8000. In Symfony, we give you like a little uh, command that, that does it for you. But like, don't get confused. That behind the scenes is just running PHP dash capital S localhost colon 8000 so that you have a web server mounted right here. The only thing that's different between like Drupal and Symfony is see how we have that web directory? That's your document root. So it's not like the whole project is in the document root. This command here actually sets up your web directory to be your document root. So if you had a virtual host, you point it at the web directory. So nothing outside of web is actually accessible. Cool. And that's it. So at this point, we've downloaded the project, and we have started the built-in web server, and now we can go to localhost, colon 8000, and we have a working, well, working, right? It's not. It's a big error page. We have a working-ish Symfony project. And really, what this is saying is, hi, I'm the Symfony Pac-Man ghost. Things are looking awesome, as you can tell by this beautiful looking error page. You just don't have any pages yet. So like this is actually a good sign at this point. Cool, so installation check. And again, what is installation? It's downloading Symfony and then running the web server, which is kind of like Drupal as well. Drupal is the extra thing when you install it that it does a bunch of setup in the database. Symfony, by default, doesn't use anything in the database. So it's, it's literally just files on your computer. If you are get fussy and don't like your project, just rm-rf it and it's gone, so it doesn't like touch anything else there. So it's just get the code, start a web server, you've got a working Symfony installation. All right, so let's build a page, which we already know the steps is gonna be route and controller. So uh, I'm gonna keep track of the files that we're modifying up there, and well, I'll have to help you because it's cutting off a little bit on top. This is, um, so we need, the first thing we need to do is create the route. The route is not a PHP file, it's a configuration file in YAML. So it's going to be in the app directory. So remember, app directory is for everything except for the PHP files. So this is an app. That's the part you can't see up there. App config routing.yml. And what we define here is, remember in Silex, we just had like slash hello slash curly brace name. It's the same thing here in YAML. You have a thing called path. That defines the path to your route. And then the other job of your route is it needs to point to that function that's going to build the page. That's the underscore controller part, which is not really a dot, dot, dot. I shortened it here. That underscore controller points to a class, colon, colon, a method name. So your controller is always a function. In Silex, it's an anonymous function. In a Symfony framework, it's just a function inside of a class. So class, colon, colon, method name. Why is it app bundle slash controller? I mean, that really can be whatever you want. There's some kind of rules about auto-loading and things like that, but you can make your namespace whatever you want. Cool, and then here's the controller part. So we created the route. Let's create that function. So inside, now this is a PHP class, right? So this is going inside of the SRC directory. So inside source slash app bundle um, slash controller, we're going to put this file here. By the way, one thing I did not mention earlier that I meant to is that uh, bundles in Symfony are kind of like modules in Drupal, except that the current recommendation is that you sort of put everything into one bundle. You know, for like Drupal people, you're like, no, have many, have many bundles have many modules. It's just kind of a philosophical thing. If you are making something that's reusable that you're going to actually share across projects, then you put it in its own bundle and make it decoupled and all that good stuff. But if you're building your app, we're just like, hey, keep your life simple and put everything into one directory. So a bundle is just like a module. It's kind of like a directory. And when you start Symfony, we kind of give you one called app bundle. So that's why we're putting our stuff inside of here. So we create the class, have the function. And there's two really, really important things I want to highlight here. One, and you'll see this in Drupal 8 and Symfony and every other framework at this point, the only rule about this file is that the namespace has to match the directory structure. So the fact that we're in a app bundle slash controller directory means our namespace is app bundle slash controller. And then because our class name is polite controller, we need to be in polite controller.php. Um, the reason has to do with auto loading and the fact, you know, basically 
It has to follow those standards or else the framework doesn't know where your class lives. And this is the same thing with Drupal 8. So just follow those rules and you'll be in good shape. The second thing is, remember I said earlier, our only job as developers is to create and return a response from our application. So in Symfony, the way we do that is literally our controllers, because our controller is a function that builds the page. So that function that we write needs to return a Symfony response object, which by the way is the same as Drupal 8's response object. Symfony response object, which is pretty simple because what's in a response? Text, and if you want to, uh, uh, the, you, know, you can change the header, or sorry, a status code, and then headers. So response is nothing more than like the content of your response and some headers. So in this case, we're returning a new response from our controller. And how you create that response is totally up to you guys. You guys could make a really nasty curl request out to a Java application here and have it do the work. And be like, oh, see, I'm, here's a response. I took the text from that API endpoint and stuck it in this response. Symfony doesn't care what you do in your controller. It's entirely up to you to do whatever work you need to do to return like the all-important response object at the bottom. Cool. And with that, we have a working page. We would define the route. We define the controller function. And it returns a response. And that is the Symfony framework. When I do Symfony trainings, like I stop at this point, and I was like, you guys now know 50% of Symfony. It's the route controller thing. This route controller thing is the same in Silex, Symfony, Drupal 8. You see this flow. It's very, very simple. Um, now, it is simple, but let's, I'm going to look ahead to like how, what kind of debugging tools do we have? Like, what if something's not working? Like, what routes do I have in my application? Maybe I inherited an application that has like 500 routes, and I'm trying to figure out where things are. So when you use the Symfony framework, you have a number of tools. First off, um, you can't see up there, I'll show you, tell you what that command is. We have a, okay, so Drupal has Drush. We have something called App Console. It's the same thing, it's an executable file that's inside of your project, basically. And you can execute commands on it that help you debug. So the part that's cutting up on top there is I'm calling that App Console command, and I'm calling a subcommand called debug colon router. And I'm basically saying, hey, application, show me all of the routes you have in the system. I want to see like what the pages are inside of our system here. The vast majority of these, the profiler thing, I'll show you that in a second, that's just a debugging tool. The key thing is, there's R on the bottom for slash hello, slash curly brace name. So you can always get a you know, picture of like what are the routes in the system. Um, this also exists inside of Drupal 8. It's a contrib project called Drupal Console. It's just like App Console, and you can also list all of the routes inside of Drupal 8. Cool. When you're using Symfony Framework, it's one of my favorite things. You have something called the Web Debug Toolbar. Um, when I don't have this, I kind of panic. Uh, sometimes if I'm not in a Symfony Framework project, I'm like, I need my Debug Toolbar. Because it has really important stuff, like if I hover over right there, it actually tells me what route was matched on this page and what controller is being called. So it's telling me polite controller, colon, colon, say hello action is what's being executed on this page. So like where am I, what code is running this page? It's telling you right there. Also has obviously like the amount of time it took, the memory. It tells you like how many database queries were made, which were none on this page. But if you do make database queries, it tells you all that stuff. And if you click any of these uh, icons here, you go into another page, which is called the Profiler, which is like the Web Debug Toolbar times 100. It has like way more information. So in this case, I can actually see all the log entries that were made on that request. Um, the routing tab there, which show me all of the routes in my system and show me which one matched for this. Security to tell me what user I have. If I sent any emails on the request, it tells me about that under the emails. And then Doctrine is the uh, engine that uh, we use for talking to a database. If you click on Doctrine, you'll be able to see every single query that was made on that page. You can even do like an explain on the query to like see why it was slow um, and all that good stuff. But the most important one is the timeline. This actually shows you everything that happens from request to response inside the Symfony framework. Because us as developers, all we do is write the route and then the controller. Like everything that happened between and around that, like we don't really know. Something else is doing that. This gives you vision into what that is. Um, it's really supposed to be there for profiling, to be like, oh, which part was slow? But you can, this is actually a great way to be like, what's going on behind the scenes? Um, also, two things I'll say about this is you can actually add your own stuff to this. So there's an object in Symfony where you can basically say, hey, I want to start timing something called API call. And then you do it. And then you say, I'm done timing that. And then when you refresh and go into this, you're going to see that line inside of this as well. So you can add whatever you want into the profiler here. The second thing I want to say is this also exists in Drupal 8, which I find fascinating. It's a contrib module called, <laughs> there's a couple clapping back there. Yes, this is huge. This is amazing. Um, this is how I learned how Drupal 8 works, because I went here. And I said, okay, let's just start opening up 
the, you can't see it here, but those are um, class names and functions. It's telling you like what functions are being called. So I was like, okay, let me go to the timeline and just open up uh, these classes, like see what they're doing, see how Drupal 8 actually works behind the scenes. Um, so it's called um, Drupal Profiler. So it's contrib module. I just installed it like a few weeks ago. It's it's working really well. Um, so again, we've done route and controller. So in order to create a page in Symfony, you touch two files, and that's it. But in the Symfony framework, we can do even less work, and we typically do. Not everybody does this. One of the things about Symfony, for better or worse, is we give you options. We never like say you have to use YAML. Every time there's configuration, you can do it in XML, YAML, PHP, or annotation. And in our docs, we even have tabs for each of them. Yes, I have some very, very good core doc contributors that like go out of their way to like do an XML version of every single code block we have on the site. So instead of doing routing in YAML, you can do it in annotations. So if you haven't heard the word annotation before, I'm guessing a lot of you have. Um, annotation is the word for a PHP comment that is actually parsed as configuration. Some people absolutely love them. Some people absolutely hate them. I happen to be on the first side of things. People that hate them are, is because like they're comments, and so they're like functionality shouldn't go into comments. Fair enough. If you don't like this, then you stick to the, the YAML version. Um, but I like this because in order to create a page, I create this file in this file alone, and that's it. So like one step to create a page inside of Symfony. And as an added bonus, right, when you're looking at this six months from now, you're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, there's the URL to this page. It's, it's right there. I don't have to go dig somewhere else to see like what, what URL is feeding into this controller function. All right, so that's the route and controller. That's the first half of Symfony. Oh, question? Yep. Yep. Oh, good question. So if you uh, create a route in YAML and this way, and you can also do an XML or PHP, which one wins? And the in the same, it's a, the answer is the same in Silex, Drupal, and Symfony. I know I'm like a broken record. Um, the routes match from top to bottom. So if you have two routes that are like that have the same pattern slash hello slash curly brace name, then it's going to match the first one. And that's because the router it actually just goes one by one to your routes, and as soon as it finds the first one that matches, it quits, which is actually kind of good for, for performance. So if you have like a thousand routes or something, um, you know, or maybe it only goes through like 50 of them and finds the one and then stops. Yep. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Oh, man, love it, love it. Okay, so but the question was like, yeah, but let me repeat my question, which is first, which actually one end, ends up being first. So in um, Symfony, like unlike Drupal, in Drupal, when you have a Drupal 8 module, it just iterates over all of your modules and like looks for a routing.yml file and loads that. So you like, there, I, I'm sure there's some ways to control that maybe, but I'm not exactly sure. In Symfony, you have a, that main app config routing.yml file that I showed earlier with where we put the YAML route. That's the only file that Symfony loads to load routes by default. So what I didn't show here is in order for this to work, there's actually an entry inside of your routing.yml that it basically says, go read annotations from this directory. And so the answer to does an annotation route win or does a YAML route win, it depends if you have the YAML route first and then the import, or do you have the import first for the annotation routes and then your YAML route below that. So it's all explicit inside of that YAML file. The import um, for reading annotations like this is actually in there by default. So I didn't show up when you actually like download the project and go into your app config routing.yml, you'll see three lines there that say, hey, go read annotations from the controller directory. All right, so second half of Symfony is all about these services and containers. Let me give you guys like 30 seconds of um, really, really simple non-computer science theory. Service, because you'll hear that term a lot, is a useful object. Um, I'm sure there's like even better definition than that. But like for me, like this is what it means. So you hear people talk about like, hey, you should turn that into a service. What are they talking about? They're talking about having an object that does some work for you. And I'll show you an example in a second. So services are just useful PHP objects. Like for example, a database connection where you can like maybe call a method called query on it. That's a service. It does some work for you. It's useful. It's called a service. It's just kind of a computer science-y sort of term. Second, the other important term is container. Container is an object but I want you to think of it almost like an associative array. It's an object that holds all of your services. So obviously we, in a Symfony application or a Drupal application, we're gonna have lots of useful objects, you know, database connection, translator object. Um, the service container is a place where we just kind of put them all into that central spot. There's more to it than that, but like that's the most important part. So if you get access to the container inside Symfony, then you have access to all of the useful objects that are inside of it. And in Symfony and Drupal, 
those come preloaded with a bunch of stuff. Like, for example, like in Symphony, well, this, is, this is actually really important. In Symphony, like nothing, everything that does work in Symphony, even like the routing controller flow, is actually done by a service. So if you ask me like what Symphony does, the answer is sort of nothing. There's just this big bag of useful objects, and those objects do the things. And if you want to do some work inside of Symphony, like log something, which I'll show later, all you need to do is say, like, what's the name of the service in the container that does logging or sends emails or does something else? Once you have that, that you're able to, once you have that name, then you can go out to the container and say, hey, I need the logger object, and it'll give it back to you. And it's what actually does all the work. And that's Yes, and there is, the question is, is there one container? Yes, there's one container. It's the most fundamentally important object inside of like Symfony or Drupal, there is one container. Yep, it's not a singleton, nothing is a singleton, there's no static context, but if you know the singleton pattern, you kind of, kind of think of it like that, because there is only one of them. Nothing's stopping you from creating multiple ones, though. So inside of Symfony, so, the, oh, so now you guys can see it. So remember I talked about that app console script? That's the way to kind of like get debugging stuff from Symfony. So uh, earlier I ran debug colon router, got the list of routes debug colon container gives you the list of all of these services inside of there. And right now, there are actually 224 useful objects inside of a standard Symfony framework install. Those, for the most part, don't do anything by themselves. They're just sitting there waiting for you, if you want to, to make use of them. Um, in Drupal, there's even more. Um, so for example, there's one service in the container called the templating service. And you wouldn't necessarily guess this. You'd read the docs, or you can even search this. If I run app console container colon, or debug colon container, and I put like temp in there, it'll actually give me a list back. It's like, here's 10 services matching that term, and you can kind of like select and get more information. So there's one called templating, and it's our way in Symfony to render twig templates. Okay? So now I know that. Like I said, it's all about in Symfony about figuring out what service does the work that I want to accomplish. So in our controller right now, we're just returning a response inside of our controller. We ultimately maybe want to render a twig template, so we found out that it's the templating service that does that. So inside of this container, I said it's like full of useful objects. It's, it's basically an associative array, so like every object has a nickname, which is a string. So this one's nickname happens to be templating in all lowercase. Okay, so when you want the templating object later, you'll ask for it by that little nickname. So, okay, so now we know that we have this routing controller flow, and we have all these random useful objects that are sitting out there waiting for us to use them. So this is good. So since the only place we really code to build a page, at least now, is the controller, what we want is to get access to the container in the controller. If we do that, then we are dangerous because we can make use of whatever objects we want. So in Symfony, and there's, of course, there's all, always like multiple ways to do this, but in Symfony, your controller has a protected property called container. The reason it does is because you extend a Symfony base controller and Symfony detects that and injects the container. So if you're like more technical, you know, if you have a more experience with that, like this is not magic. This is something that does this behind the scenes. Um, but basically means when you're in a controller, you can just say this arrow container and that's the service container object. And it only has basically one useful method on it, git. Because like I said, it's basically an associative array of useful objects. So we're gonna say this arrow container arrow git templating that returns us back that useful object, and then we can just call a method on it. How do we know a method to call on a service? Um, you know, that's you, you, you can read the documentation to figure out like how does Symfony's templating object work. Um, you can also look at this here and see, oh, this is an instance of this time to twig engine. So if you like diving into the source code and finding what methods are on stuff, you can do it that way. So you don't have to like dive into source code because we have great documentation on all this, but. So we get the service, call render on it, and then we pass it, you know, the polite slash say hello dot html dot twig that's gonna be the name of our template and then we pass a variable into that twig template so the my name on the left will be like how that variable is called in twig and its value will be assigned to name so I've made those different for clarity purposes and then still we always return a response um, and by the way like I'm showing you guys some of the longer ways of doing things we have shortcut methods in symphony framework to do this kind of stuff so normally you'd actually say this arrow render instead of this arrow container arrow get templating render. I'm showing you this way because this is really what's going on behind the scenes. When you say this arrow render, which is what you'll see in our documentation, that's a shortcut to go get the templating service and call render on it. So I'm showing us like really the low level way because I want you, us to understand that it's all about these services behind the scenes that do all the work. But your code will actually in reality be a little bit smaller than this, which is cool. 
So we're rendering a template called polite slash say hello .html twig. And just as a reminder, because I got rid of my YAML route, we've only touched one file so far in our project. This one right here. We built our page, and now we're using the templating engine. So the second thing is, and remember that, so polite slash say hello .html twig, that's the name of our template. Symfony looks for templates, because they're not PHP code, in the app directory. And it looks for them in the app resources views directory. So when we say polite slash say hello .html twig, it just looks for app, that's the part you can't see up there, app, actually app slash resources, they're both hiding, app resources views, and then polite slash say hello .html twig. So Symfony is like a main spot where templates live. You can put them other places if you want. There's one main spot that the templates live, and when you render something, Symfony just looks there, and it's pretty straightforward. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Twig. Other people are talking about Twig. It's amazing. Uh, this is me printing out a variable, very fancy, um, and also extending a base template. So now we've touched two files to uh, create our Symfony project. That base.html, that Twig is your base layout. You can do whatever you want with it. We actually kind of deliver a very basic one to you in a project to start but you'll customize it. So we've gone one small level up, which is we have the routing controller flow. And now we know that there's this service container floating around, and it's something that we're going to make use of from within our controller, because it's this big bag of tools. So what else does Symfony do? What other useful objects are there? And like, the reason I, part of the reason I put this up here is because if you want, the answer to this question can be nothing. You could not use any of the objects in the container. That's totally up to you. If you have a different way of creating your page inside of your controller in Symfony, by all means, use your other tools. You don't have to use any of Symfony's built-in tools. They're there as a tool, like optional tool, if like, it's useful to you. Um, but sometimes I see people like using Symfony tools in a very like, they have a really advanced, crazy edge use case. Like maybe it's an HTML form that's like really, really weird, and they try to put it in Symfony's form system, and they get really aggravated. Um, but when you back off, you're like, dude, you had a form with two fields. Just make an HTML form and then handle it in a controller. Like you don't have to fit everything into the Symfony tool set if it doesn't work well for you in your use case. So for example, what does Symfony do? It has integration with a library called Doctrine, which is an ORM for talking to the database. Um, and what I want you guys to notice here is how do you use Doctrine inside of Symfony? Well, it's a service called doctrine.orm.entityManager. So like everything in Symfony is just a service. So how does Symfony talk to the database? It doesn't. This service does, though. So you can use it, or you can actually, again, if you have like a really advanced use case, you can go one level lower, and there's another service in Symfony called Database Connection, which is actually also part of Doctrine. And basically, you make, this is not entirely true, you make just raw SQL queries to it, and then you fetch results out. This is like a small wrapper around the PDO object, and it's in the container there for you to use. Forms, I mentioned this earlier. This is what it looks like to make a form in Symfony. You actually like build this nice, beautiful object, and you tell it, I have like a, e, an email, a username, gender field. You kind of describe it. You eventually pass this into your template on the bottom. I'll show you that in a second. And in the middle, you actually process the form. So this is where, if this were a post request, um, it will like go grab all the post parameters for you and like do validation. So there's like a lot that goes into Symfony's form uh, system. It's probably the second most complicated part of uh, Symfony um, after security. Um, but it's one where, like, the more you learn about it, the more you're like, this is awesome. Uh, and this is what it would look like inside of your template to render that. So you don't have to render it by hand. You just sort of say, you kind of render your fields one by one, and it kind of builds the HTML form for you, which, of course, you can customize how this looks um, in all, all kinds of different ways. It's called form theming in Symfony. So this is really, really powerful. Or you could just do it yourself. So, again, optional tools. Like, Symfony's, like, there, and, like, these tools are wonderful. I use them. Um, but especially when you're like learning, if like you're like, dude, I just like, don't understand the form thing yet. I'm having problems. Cool. Go into a Twig template, make an HTML form, and then in your controller, just go and get those post parameters manually. So that's Symfony's request object. Obviously, I'm, I have, there's some extra code that would go around this. That's Symfony's request object, which is the same as Drupal's request object. And if you want to get post parameters, dollar sign underscore post off of it, you say request arrow request arrow get. Query parameters are request, arrow, query, arrow, get. Why is it request, arrow, request? What kind of idiot would make a property called request on an object called request? Now, it turns out, apparently, if you read something somewhere, like post parameters are known as request parameters. So hence why request, arrow, request, arrow, get. Um, and there's infinitely more things that you can do in Symfony via tools in the core, of course, but also bundles. So just like you guys have contrib modules, we have community open source bundles. The number one job of a bundle, like why would I bring a bundle into my project? 
and this is the statement's exactly true for Drupal 8 and modules. The number one job that an open source bundle brings to your project, the thing that it does, is it adds more services to your container. And that's basically it. It's like, oh, I'm going to get this bundle, which helps me talk to Amazon's SDK, because when I install it, I suddenly have a new service in the container called, I don't know, AWS underscore S3, and that's an object that's useful that can help me talk to Amazon AWS S3. All right, so we have services in the container. So next thing we need to do is actually put some of our own cord. Well, actually, let me back up. So we have the routing controller flow, and we have services in the container. So this next step has nothing to do with Symfony at all. But it's like fundamentally important to like the new pattern that uh, is kind of like in Drupal 8 and the pattern we use in Symfony a lot. And it's creating your own services. So remember, service is just a useful object. So I'm talking about creating your own classes to organize your code. Because once upon a time, okay, so we all know like we don't want to duplicate code, et cetera, et cetera. We want to reuse stuff. So normally if you have like a whole bunch of um, uh, code inside of, give like, like 20 lines of code. Like in old school PHP, we take those 20 lines of code that maybe help us generate a thumbnail or something, and we put them into a flat function called generate thumbnail. Because now we can reuse it, and it's kind of like over there by itself. So in Symfony and Drupal 8, we're going to do the exact same thing, but instead of a flat function, it's just going to be a function inside of a class. But the exact same thing. You're like, oh, I want to isolate this. Okay? Function inside of a class. And that class is going to be a service class, but again, that's just kind of computer science-y sort of stuff. So right now... Um, you know, when you go to slash hello slash Ryan or DrupalCon or whatever, it just says hello, that name. So we have a new requirement where we're going to actually generate a random greeting, like hola, Ryan, or something like that. So where should we put this? We could put it in our controller. Totally, you know, you guys can imagine what the code would look like. You know, a little array of random things, do an array rand, et cetera, et cetera, pick out a random greeting, boom, all the code in the controller, no problem. But you're supposed to keep your controller skinny, which, you know, it's a way of organizing your code. You're supposed to, whenever you have big chunks of code that do a job, take that out and put it somewhere else so that it's, you can reuse it and it's a little more clear and your controllers are easier to read. So what we're going to do in Symfony or Drupal 8 is create a class. So I'll, and this class, the name of this class, the location of this class, none of that is important. Except your namespace has to match your directory structure and your class name has to match your file name .php. So there's always that requirement. But otherwise, you can put this, name this however you want. So I have a class called random greeter, and I have a public function called randomly greets, and the code there is super, super simple, so nothing special at all. I'm using a private static property for the greetings, but you know, this is just basically what we would have done in a flat function before. Super straightforward, just put inside of a class. Cool, so that was nice. Um, so now, how can we use this? We just use it. So if you put things in a flat function, you just call that flat function. The only added step here is you need to instantiate your object first, so that's greeter equals new random greeter. That's kind of the extra step. And then you just call the method on that object. So create the object, use the object. Same pattern, though, as before is with the flat function. Same goal of organizing our code. So again, none of this has anything to do with Symfony. Symfony doesn't care that you're doing this, doesn't know you're doing this. Um, it's just us being like, you know what, I want to organize my code a little bit better. So let's up the ante a little bit. Could we log which greeting was chosen? Maybe that's really important. We're having problems somewhere. We want to log that. Well, question number one is like, well, does Symfony have built-in logging? Um, and it turns out it actually does. And we know that if Symfony logs, if Symfony has the ability to log out of the box, there must be a service that's actually doing that. And it turns out there's a service is called Logger. So if you want to log something in Symfony, you go out and get the Logger service. Okay, so now inside of our controller, very simple. This arrow container arrow get Logger. So again, it's always like, go grab the service you need, and then call a method on it. How did I know to call info on here? Well, I either opened up the class that's the logger, or I just Googled, you know, Symfony's logger and read the documentation on what methods the logger gives me. Okay? So perfectly straightforward. It's another way we're just, like, using one of those optional tools. Love it. Okay, so this is where things get interesting. Could we log something from inside of random greeter? So the copy and paste method would give us this. So I'm inside of uh, class random greeter. I've just basically copied that this arrow container arrow get thing. Uh, probably most of you are even like, that's not going to work because there's no container property. Notice this class is not extending anything. Why is it not extending anything? Because it's not useful for my application to make it extend anything. Symfony doesn't know or care about this, so you, we don't have to extend anything. This is just our core class. There's nothing magical about this at all. We don't have a container property here, so it's not going to work. In fact, the whole container property thing is totally special to controllers. 
So don't expect to like magically get a container property anywhere except for your controllers. So this would be, you know, method, you know, property doesn't exist or method called on a non-object or some error like that. Oh my God. So dependency injection. How many people have heard this term by this point? Good, 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 good. Fanciest term for the stupidest, simplest idea of all time. So, oh, oh. dependency injection is when you pass a function all of the values it needs to do its work. The ridiculous example I give is you would never make a function called add and then not give it any arguments. Be like, you figure out what I'm adding. You know, I'm not going to pass you the two values. You go out to some global scope and figure it out yourself. I mean, this doesn't make any sense. So we take this a step further inside of um, uh, Drupal 8 and Symfony. And the more realistic example is like you used to have flat functions. And on the first line of that flat function, you'd say like global dbh. You would actually go outside of the global scope to get some database handler object or something like that. That's not dependency injection. Your function needs the database connection, so you should actually pass that in as an argument. So that's all dep dependency injection. It's all what we've been doing all along. Even when we use the global keyword, we're probably like, ooh, I'm not supposed to do that. Um, so in practice, since we have our functions in classes, what this means is whenever your class, whenever any function in your class needs an outside object or an outside value, you're going to add an argument to your construct function and put it there. And then what are you going to do in your construct function? You're just going to set it on a private property. Basically save it for later. And that's it. If you want to get really fancy, you can you know, like look up like the class or interface that the, the logger uh, implements. Um, but that's optional. That's cool. It's cool for auto-completion. But you don't have to do that. Then now that our, we have this private logger property, uh, we just use that down there. So instead of this arrow container arrow git logger, we just say this arrow logger and call it. Now we are missing a step here. Like, don't expect that to work. You should be thinking, yeah, but like, who who's going to pass that there? The point is, this class now, because that's a required construct argument, cannot be used unless whoever instantiates it passes it a logger interface object. So as far as random greeter is concerned, he doesn't care who is going to use him. Whoever uses him has to pass in the logger. So inside of our controller, we'll just do that. We'll say greeter equals new random greeter. And we know how to get the logger inside of our controller. We just say this arrow container arrow get logger. Pass the logger into the construct, set it on a property, and then we use it later. That's the dependency injection pattern. And you'll do that over and over and over again. If all of a sudden our random greeter needs to render a template, we're going to add a second constructor argument for the templating object. Set that on a second property, and then use that property down within one of our functions. Cool? So that entire thing was all about code organization, dependency injection, had nothing to do with Symfony. The last and very, very important piece of this is we're going to actually teach Symfony how to instantiate that random greeter object, which is a service because it's a useful object, does some work for us. We're going to teach Symfony how to instantiate that for us. And the way to do that is with a YAML file. And you can't see it here, but this says app slash config slash services.yml. We were in the app config directory earlier because there's app config routing.yml. So when you want to teach Symfony's container how to instantiate your objects, you go into this file and you just describe that. So instead of us instantiating our random greeter, we're going to have Symfony do it for us. In order for us to do that, we have to say, hey, Symfony, I have a service whose nickname is going to be my random greeter. So that's the key I'm going to use later to get it out. And when you instantiate it, when I ask for it and you need to instantiate it, its class is that class. And it has one constructor argument, which is the logger service. If I had multiple constructor arguments, they would just be like another dash on the next line. And also, see, the only kind of like weird thing in here is that at symbol. If you take off the at symbol, it will literally inject the string logger. It will pass the string logger, which you, may be what you want. Like if you're passing configuration, totally legit. But if you want it to be a service, like, no, 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 it's not the string logger. It's the service logger. You put the at symbol, and then the service container is like, oh, yeah, 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 okay, I'll go get the logger service first, and then pass that in as an argument. So this is enough to teach Symfony how to actually instantiate that object. And now we can go to our app console, debug colon container, my underscore random underscore greeter, and our service is now in the container. So whatever number I had before, like 216 services in the container, is now 217 services in the container, because our guy's in there. How do we use that? Very simple. We just don't have to instantiate the object anymore. That's like, it's such a small thing. Not that instantiating the object was difficult, but we've just centralized that. So this arrow container arrow get my random greeter, and that's it. The kind of cool thing about this, and actually turns out to be huge, is that in our controller, which is a kind of our day-by-day -day code, we don't really care how many constructor arguments that, uh, that service has. So if later we're using this in like 50 places in our code, and we decide it needs a second constructor argument, 
we can just go to services.yml and give it a second constructor argument. Because this code is just like, just give me the random greeter. Whatever it takes, just give that to me. Um, also, corollary, any services in the container, there's always only one of them. So if you ask for my random greeter like 10 times in a request, you just get back the same instance. Second thing I'll say is it's also lazy. I keep describing the container as an array of useful objects. It's actually an array of directions on how to create those objects if and when we ask for them. So if we go a whole request response cycle and nobody ever asks for my random greeter, um, we don't use the memory to instantiate that object. That object is never actually instantiated. So you can have 230 useful objects floating around without actually adding any extra overhead. You're only actually instantiating them if you use them. Okay, and let's see here. Okay, I'm going to go through this very quickly. This part here, so like now at this point you guys know everything you need to know, like all the most fundamental things of using Symfony. You can go download it, start playing around with it, you're good to go. This last thing, very quickly, is extra credit. This is a little bit harder, um, but it's also something that you don't do every single day. So Symfony has events, just like Drupal has hooks, and Drupal 8 also has events. So you think of events and hooks as basically the same idea. It's a way to come hook into a process. Um, and the way it works in Symfony is you have a, the events are less about like what you want to do, like hook menu, and more about timing. As Symfony goes through that request, response, router, controller flow, it kind of has these hook points at various times during that process. So if you want to have a hook point very early on in Symfony, you, the event you want to listen to is called kernel.request. And you know, one, the one that's really late is called kernel.response. So I keep saying that you have to return a response from your controller. Okay, it's like, you, that's our job, return a response from the controller. Okay, well technically, and in a Symfony framework, most people do, do that. Most people do not go to this extra level of fanciness. I just want to like see, what can we do with Symfony here? What kind of craziness can we do? So let's say that we come from the Drupal world and we love the render array. So we're like, you know what I got to get? I got to get some render array up in my Symfony. Okay, so we start doing something like that. Maybe we even put like some hashtag stuffs on there uh, just to make us feel at home. So now I'm just returning this random array, the template key and variables key, and that's it. If you do this, you will get a terrible exception that says, I'm so angry right now because you didn't return a Symfony response object from your controller and I told you to do that under all circumstances. Well, it turns out you don't have to do that. There's an event after your controller is fired that if you don't return a response from your controller, you can add a hook, a listener, to this event. Uh, and you can basically try to transform whatever that value is into a symphony response. Um, so very quickly, this is actually what a listener, which again is kind of like an implementation of a hook, looks like in Symfony or Drupal 8. Uh, the important parts down there on the get subscribed events, you're basically saying, I listen to an event called kernel.view. It's one of Symfony's core events. And when that event happens, I want you to call my onView function, which is that function up there, which is empty right now. And I also, since I know we're going to wa want to render a template inside of this class, I've already gone, done the step with the dependency injection where I'm injecting the temp, I have the argument for my templating object. Because I know in a second I'm going to need the templating object to render a template. Okay? So the next step is we just reg register this as a service. So it's pretty common. You're always going to be registering this as a service. The difference with this service, though, is I don't intend to use this in my controller, like our random greeter we use in our controller. I want Symfony to use this. I want to hook this into Symfony so it actually calls my function when that event happens. So the way you do that, and this is a little bit more advanced, but you'll see this all the time in Symfony and Drupal 8, is with a tag. So a lot of times you're like, I, I need to like hook into core in some way. When you like Google, how do I add an event subscriber? Or how do I add a, um, I don't even know, uh, a custom route loader? Something that's really custom hooking into the system? The answer is always going to be make a service and then give it a specific tag. When Symfony boots, it looks for all services that have that kernel.event subscriber tag, and it kind of like consumes them, says these guys are event listeners. So it's a little bit like I said, it's a little more advanced. That's kind of like a way to say my service is important. It's not just a normal service. I need to do something in core in some special way. So there's a finite number of those tags in the system. So cool. So now inside of our on view function, that's going to be called after our controller. Um, and basically, I'm not going to go through the specifics here, um, but we can just get the result back, that array that we return from the controller. And then down there at the bottom, we're like, okay, we had a template key, we had a variables key, um, and then. Just like we did in our controller earlier, we'll say this arrow templating arrow render. Because remember, I, I passed the templating uh, service in as an argument to my controller and put that on a templating property. And then we just set the response on the bottom. Cool. So I said that part is something you don't do every day. That's like us being like, can we Kung Fu Symphony? Uh, can we do something we're not supposed to be able to do? All right. So last thing, like you guys getting into this stuff. Was there a question? Question? Yep, go for it.
Oh, good, yeah. So the app console that where you can view uh, the services, is there a way to view listeners there as well? There actually is. Uh, there's also something in the profiler. He has like a debug colon event dispatcher or something like that. And you get a list of all the listeners of the services, which is really key because like listeners are magic. There's no way you can't like follow execution flow and see listeners. So th what I'll leave you guys with is um, like extra things because I want you guys to like get started with this. Like it's not hard. If you have a problem um, that you need to solve that doesn't involve a CMS, use Symphony or use Silex, the little tiny thing. Like people use Silex for all kinds of stuff. So one thing we have, in, in addition to like just starting a new project, we have a Symphony demo. So that same installer we used earlier, where we said Symphony new and then a directory, you can say Symphony demo, and it downloads a full kind of fully featured Symphony application. Uh, talks to the database, does forms. You can look around there; it's all like really well annotated with like here's why we're doing this. Um, so it's really really good. It's actually kind of a newer thing that we have. Um, so older Symphony users might not even realize this exists, but it's fantastic. We're always adding more stuff to it. Um, this is what it looks like. You have like security, you can log in, all, all kinds of good stuff. Um, we even have this fancy button where you can like click the button and see the source code that's like uh, in charge of that page. Second thing is, um, especially when you get into this for the first time, um, I, you don't have to do this. Like I don't mean to step on anybody's workflow, but like PHP Storm is a wonderful ID. It helps you with the auto completion of the classes. There's also ridiculous Symphony plugins. So just go to bit.ly slash PHP Storm dash Symphony. Um, it gives you auto completion in all kinds of amazingly weird ways. Um, our documentation is gigantic. I think it's like a thousand pages if you print it out. Um, then also our site, Camp University, if you want screencasts, we have like screencasts all up and down about Symphony, and all the scripts are free too. So if you want to just read the scripts and look at the code blocks, you can just go there and do that right now. Um, I said also like use Silex, use Drupal 8 because they're all using the same things. So I'm gonna go through this because you guys already know this. Um, so all this is like you have three tools now, Symphony, Silex, and Drupal. And really, there's even more stuff that uses the Symphony components. So your world is even bigger than this. And you can go to and from them without having to like relearn a whole thing. Because we just learned all of the concepts in like 40 minutes. Routes, controller, services. That's it. It's all the same across them. So you can use Silex to learn Drupal 8. You can use Silex to learn Symphony. You can use Symphony to learn Drupal, vice versa. So choose whatever tool is actually going to help you. Um, and that's it. Thank you guys very, very much. Um, if you guys want to get started in Symphony and you like the screencast thing, I have a coupon code there on the bottom. See what I did there? It's Hollywood D8. See, I was trying to think of something clever, right? I'm going to keep that up for like a day. So go on to Camp University, and that gives you like a free all access month. And uh, we don't ask for your credit card or anything like that, so it's no weirdness. Um, and if you like it, you guys can tell, tell us. And I think I'm probably over time. So if you have any questions, uh, come down and uh, ask them. Um, otherwise, enjoy the conference. <laughs>